So patients who are going to have homocystinuria are going to have what we call a marfanoid habitus. And I really want to kind of integrate how that looks on your physical exam uh, sentence in your USMLE vignette. And that is that patients with marfanoid habitus are going to have this tall, thin build. They're going to have flexible joints as well as scoliosis. From a facey standpoint, these patients are going to have issues with lens dislocation, which we'll talk about. They're going to have a high arch neck and crowded teeth. They're also going to have a very characteristic and sentinel physical exam feature known as a pectus deformity, either a carinatum or escavatum, so chest wall deformities. Now, the other thing that these patients are going to have are these long arms with very, very long fingers. And so this is going to be a very classic habitus for you to recognize on the USMLE because there are going to be some various differentials for you to know. Now, patients with Marfan syndrome are going to have, or especially with Marfanoid habitus, they're going to have issues with their blood vessels, specifically related to their aorta. They can have aortic dilation, aneurysms, or even dissections. They're also going to have, at times, redundant connective tissue right on the mitral valve, and that's going to be known as mitral valve prolapse. Patients with a marfanoid habitus are going to also have a predilection to develop what we call apical blebs, basically out pouches of air that can suddenly pop and give you a spontaneous pneumothorax. So if you see on your exam question, a patient who has Marfan syndrome and they suddenly have shortness of breath, you are going to be thinking about, ooh, rupture of ap apical blebs that are going to create a spontaneous pneumothorax. So what's important for us to recognize is that the US family is gonna give us many different chest X-rays. And one of the chest X-rays that they want you to recognize is this widened mediastinum. And the widened mediastinum actually refers to the aortic dissection. And so say that they give a patient who is going to have this tearing chest pain, a marfanoid habitus, and they are going to give this X-ray of a widened mediastinum, you're going to be worried about an aortic dissection. This picture is what I was just talking about related to the spontaneous pneumothorax. And as you can see here in this picture, you have the lung, which is here, that has collapsed down and a lot of blackness, which is going to just be air. And remember that the mechanism behind the spontaneous pneumothorax, which is air in the plural space, the mechanism is going to be a rupture of that apical blood. All right, let's go ahead and talk about this next question. Which of the following maneuvers will increase the intensity following, uh, increase the intensity of this uh, murmur description? When I say mid systolic click, what murmur do you think of? And which of the following maneuvers is going to increase the noise of that murmur? Go ahead and just put in the multiple choice answer into the chat box. All right, and real quick, is there still some microphone feedback? Can somebody just uh, confirm that for me? All right, let me see if I, I'm gonna just change my microphone. Does that help? All right, wonderful. So when it comes to your murmur description that is going to increase your mitral valve prolapse, the correct answer is going to be D, Valsalva. Remember that in mitral valve prolapse, what you have is you have this redundant connective tissue right on the mitral valve. And whenever you have this redundant connective tissue, whenever the heart is going to be very, very empty, 
the connective tissue is going to parachute up and those that redundant tissue is going to click, 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 click right on top of each other. And so the key concept here is that an empty heart, i.e. a heart devoid of preload is going to cause you to have an earlier onset of the mid systolic click. And that is going to be very important. Why? Because that then is going to suggest that the murmur is going to be louder. Now, what is another cardiac lesion that gets louder with decreased left ventricular end diastolic volume? I'll give you a hint. Left ventricular end diastolic volume, also known as preload, but I wanted to integrate that concept in. And if you said hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, you are absolutely correct just so that I can draw that in a clear manner. Here is going to be your heart, forgive my drawing. Here is going to be the LV. And remember, we're talking about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which is going to be a defect in a hypertrophy of the intraventricular septum. Now, whenever you have maneuvers that are going to be decreasing preload, for example, you're going to have Valsalva, or you're going to have standing, for example, any maneuver that decreases your left ventricular end diastolic volume, again, that's going to be a synonym for preload, you are going to now have an empty heart, and that empty heart is going to allow the interventricular septum, which is going to be hypertrophy, to hit the ventricular free wall. And I think that that's a very important concept for us to recognize, is that an empty heart is going to cause the murmur for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy to be louder. Now, remember that hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, usually on your USMLE, presents as an athlete who is going to have syncope or sudden cardiac death. And they may have this lesion as their underlying cause. All right. So we talked about marfanoid habitus, we integrated mitral valve prolapse. Now let's go ahead and talk about the differential diagnosis of marfanoid habitus for the USMLE. When you're thinking about marfanoid habitus, think about good old Marfan syndrome, which is going to be a fibrillin-1 mutation, and that gives you what? Poor elastin. Second, you want to think about homocystinuria. Homocystinuria also is going to be related to the CBS deficiency, marfanoid habitus, in a hypercoagulable state. Number three, you want to understand that patients with Klinefelter syndrome are going to have marfanoid habitus. And remember, this is going to be an example of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. And then finally, you want to integrate MEN2B, which is multiple endocrine neoplasia 2B, which is associated with the RET oncogene mutation, marfanoid habitus, oral gangliomas, and bilateral pheochromocytomas. This is a very important slide. Take some time to just scan it. Excellent. And now let's go ahead and keep going. So Marfan syndrome, I'm going to be talking about the one that is specifically related to the fibrillin-1 defect. The fibrillin-1 defect is then going to cause what? bad elastin downstream. And elastin is going to be what makes your skin nice and rubber bandy. Now, in this connective tissue disorder, you are going to have issues with the lens being dislocated. This is a subtle point that the USMLE likes to go for. And that is that with Marfan syndrome, the lens go up superior and lateral temporally, superior temporally. Whereas in homocystinuria, you are going to have the lens go infero medially towards the nose. Patients with Marfan syndrome are going to have hyperextensive skin, just like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, joint hypermobility, and they could even have winged scapula, which remember, we associate winged scapula with what nerve damage? That is going to be the long thoracic nerve. From a neuro standpoint, these patients are going to have connective tissue defects in the blood vessels of the brain. And that can lead to berry aneurysm formation and bam, a thunderclap headache on your USMLE 
which is going to be subarachnoid hemorrhage. You also want to integrate aortic root abnormalities and mitral valve prolapse, which we went to, went through, and from a respiratory standpoint, the spontaneous pneumothoraces.